The recent elections in Canada were won by a Liberal Party that, after years of neoliberal politics, tacked moderately but effectively to the left. They defeated their right-wing conservative rivals, but they also crushed the new Democratic Party, ostensibly a party to the left of the Liberals. In addition, as The Guardian reports, a record number of Indigenous candidates were elected to Parliament. The Conservatives had won four consecutive federal elections since 2006. The Liberals, having lurched to the right, had been relegated to third place. The New Democrats, after the 2011 election, were the official opposition. The turnout in this election at 68% was at its highest since the early 1990s and part of the reason for the Liberals' overwhelming victory. But under the charismatic boy leader, Justin Trudeau, the Liberals have finally turned it around. The Conservatives lost 8% of their vote, but the New Democrats lost over 10%. How? Much of the media was far too impressed with Trudeau's looks to offer a coherent review of the results. London's right-wing free sheet, The Evening Standard, offered 25 reasons why we love new Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, noting among these that he had nice hair, could box, had been known to wear a kilt, and was a cheerful partaker of the pleasures of dope. This reached across the media, far and wide, all the way to the South China Morning Post, whose winking headline suggested that Trudeau was not just a pretty face. The internet buzz sites, with an unfailing ability to miss the point, offered hot takes both on why it is not okay to objectify Justin Trudeau, as Huffington Post writes, and on why it is in fact okay to objectify Justin Trudeau, as shown by BuzzFeed. On a more august level, the liberal magazine Salon featured an analysis of our collective freakout over Trudeau, offering an historical analysis of the semiotics of nice hair. What is far more significant, given the global neoliberal consensus, is that Trudeau won mainly on a pledge to implement Keynesian deficit spending. This provided a key point of differentiation with his conservative rivals, as the Canadian business puts it. The decades-long obsession with balanced budgets in Canadian politics was broken. Stephen Harper, having fixated himself on the slogan of a balanced budget, ended up looking dogmatic and foolish, and CBC reports that leading economists warned that dropping oil prices will cut into federal revenues and stunt economic growth this year, thus making a balanced budget recessionary. As the Globe and Mail reports, polling found that 54% of the public support a deficit-led growth strategy. Not everyone wants to face up to the implications of this. David Olive, writing as business correspondent for the Toronto Star in his article about Trudeau fixing the pothole nation, claims that Trudeau's immediate task upon being elected is to convince Canadians he is a prudent fiscal manager. By this, he appears to mean that Trudeau must not go too far or too quickly beyond the agenda of his opponents. But the Liberals only won by outflanking the New Democrats moderately from the left. As Michael Rosworski, coming from the left, put it in Ricochet, in an election devoid of class politics, Liberals won on the economy. Trudeau did not only win on the economy. The Conservative administration, which has just been deposed, was arguably one of the most right-wing Canadian governments in living memory. Conservative leader Stephen Harper unashamedly used Islamophobia to mobilize the Conservative base, as when he claimed that what he called Islamicism was the biggest threat to Canada shown here by CBC News. David Mastracci, writing for Al Jazeera, suggested that Islamophobia sells in Canada. Perhaps, but most voters didn't buy it this time. Trudeau rejected the Islamophobic fear-mongering in a way that predecessors such as Michael Ignatieff would have been far more reluctant to do. And as Matthew Iglesias wrote for Vox, the gamut backfired and lost Harper the election. Yet on other issues, the Liberals were clearly weaker than their new Democrat rivals. One of the most controversial of Harper's measures, fully consistent with the Islamophobic thrust of his government, was Bill C-51. The idea was to create a new spy agency that, justified by a crackdown on supposed terrorism, would have extensive powers to target citizens and activists. The bill was so controversial that Canada's Global News reports that even conservative groups pleaded with Harper to stop the legislation. 
Here, the Liberals should have been in a difficult position, having actually voted for the bill in the first place. As the Ottawa Citizen reports, Trudeau openly defends this vote, while the New Democrats oppose the bill. Trudeau did not promise to abolish the bill, but in a classic manoeuvre of triangulation, suggested that he would amend the bill and repeal parts of it, again shown here by the Globe and Mail. As part of a conventionally hawkish foreign policy agenda, Harper signed a series of agreements with Israel, including the promise to crack down on boycott, divestment and sanctions movement in Canada. On this, the Liberals remain in line with establishment thinking. Earlier this year, Trudeau tweeted his vehement opposition to the campaign of boycott, divestment and sanctions in Canadian universities aimed at Israel's persecution of the Palestinians. So the Liberals did not have to be the major beneficiaries of the backlash against a decade of Conservative rule. Indeed, until very recently, they were considered highly likely to trail in third place with the New Democrats in with a chance of forming a government. How did the New Democrats, the official opposition these last four years, come out so far down? The answer lies in the Blairite turn taken by the New Democrats under the leadership of Thomas Mulcair. Mulcair's Tony Blair moment, as John Iverson dubbed it in Canada's National Post, took place over two years ago when he convinced his party to water down the party's constitution. Canada's third way advocates, Eugene Lang and Matt Brown, cheered on this turn extolling New Labour as a blueprint for Thomas Mulcair in an editorial for the Toronto Star. Mulcair has spoken glowingly of Thatcherism and the wind of freedom and liberalism that he claimed it blew through a stagnant UK economy. And this was reflected in the New Democrats campaign as it begun this year. Eager to prove themselves a party fit for government, they committed themselves to balanced budgets. And this, of necessity, deprived the party of any significant means to attack the forms of poverty and inequality which are the basis of their political support. And nor was it just on the economy that the New Democrats moved to the right. During the build-up to the campaign, as Ricochet Media reported, they had begun to police and purge their pro-Palestine candidates so as not to disturb Canada's pro-Israel consensus. In general, the New Democrats seemed to be doing everything they could to become a more conventional party. And it looked as though it might be working when the election campaign began this year. The New Democrats were the party most likely to defeat the ruling Conservatives. Governmental power was just around the corner. But in late August, Justin Trudeau, campaigning for the Liberals, announced that any government run by him would immediately break with the austerity agenda of its opponents and embark upon three years of deficit spending. That was the beginning of the Liberal turnaround. As Sid Ryan writes in the Toronto Sun, it allowed Trudeau to say that the New Democrats backed a Stephen Harper budget that would inevitably lead to severe austerity measures. Mulcair went on, nevertheless, braving each new round of dismal polls by doubling down on his position, boasting to CBC News that the balanced budget commitment was his idea. Even in the final week, he was exuding optimism and confidence to anyone who would listen. Thomas Walkham in the Toronto Star put the calamity down to one simple dilemma. What is the point of a faux Liberal Party when the real Liberals already exist? Walkham explained that the NDP has been going all out to present itself as moderate, has shied away from taxing the rich and downplayed its ties to organised labour, while the Liberal adoption of anti-Austerian economics led centre-left economist Paul Krugman to marvel in the New York Times, Keynes comes to Canada. Even The Economist, which generally favours pro-business politics, acknowledged that the NDP's cautious campaign drove photos seeking change into the Liberal camp. In the final days of the election campaign, Trudeau's modest proposals to raise taxes on the wealthiest Canadians induced the spittle-flecked fury of one Kevin O'Leary, a leading entrepreneur, who argued that the rich were preparing to flee the country if taxes were raised too high, as he told CTV News. It is a similar story with much of the press coverage which extols the ambitious nature of Trudeau's proposed reforms. In truth, just like his Obama-style election campaign, this has simply made Trudeau seem far more interesting than he really is. Mulcair struck one of his only really successful digs at Trudeau when he said, he hasn't stood for anything, now he stands for everything as the Globe and Mail shows. Indeed, Trudeau's discovery of many of his campaigning issues was rather late. The spectre of Obama mania looms large, 
the Liberals have form in responding to social movement pressures by adopting their themes while gutting them of substantial content, just as Obama did. In the last analysis, argues Damien Gills at the Common Sense Canadian, Trudeau may be more dangerous than Harper regarding Canada's oil and gas-driven environmental policy as he made special effort to outflank Harper to the right on the controversial Keystone Pipeline. And nor are the relatively progressive policies secure. As the medium argues, Trudeau's success recalls the liberal campaign of the early 1990s based on the Red Book a list of progressive policies that would be implemented. Shortly, the Liberal leader, Paul Martin, told his party's backbenchers, screw the Red Book, and began to implement budget balancing austerity. Just because the electorate has moved on from triangulation, austerity, and neoliberal politics, doesn't mean that the Liberal Party really has.